All right, down here in this beautiful riverside paradise. Well, it has it has hints and remnants of paradise. And uh, I wanted to talk about a few things because even though we can see in this beautiful creation the marks of a creator, which the First Nations knew about, we can also see that in the current state of the world, there's a lot of garbage around, both, uh, you know, physically and also just mentally, emotionally, there's the, the curse, you know, the fall. We still see evidence that the original humans went off track. We have tried to manage, be gods on our own and manage the earth and uh, we have not been good stewards. And this is, I'm in uh, Eastern Europe right now, so this sort of uh, really flourishing civilization which discovered, you know, a lot of witty inventions uh, ended up not always being good stewards. And I believe the foundations of the Western wisdom, if you look at it uh, deeply, even Greek uh, culture, highly respected and was influenced by the, the ancient laws of Moses, the wisdom of Solomon, the Ten Commandments, how to structure society in a compassionate way. Um, it says that ancient historians say that the Hebrews were known as an ancient people and they were respected and they're uh, by all nations. And this is a historian writing more than like about 2,000 years ago talking about the ancient Hebrew people. Uh, and there's something about these people and they lived in tribes just like uh, First Nations and many, pretty much every culture group was living in tribes. Um, kind of nomadic, like if you go way back, kind of pastoral, like shepherds or hunter-gatherers, nomadic. Um, and there's an interesting uh, kind of subtext, you could say, about city dwellers, those who got into the, you could say, the agricultural revolution and started to make big cities, which in the beginning the creator Yahweh the I am that I am said to the original humans Adam and Eve spread out over the earth you are gonna you're gonna have dominion in the way of uh, having dominion is not like I'm gonna just keep it under my thumb but it's you are the stewards you're the gardeners or the tenders of my garden well we have messed up the garden we actually violated and disobeyed the only com original command to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is basically trying to be a judge <clears throat> and figure everything out with just your noggin and l wisdom apart from a relationship with God. Uh, the relationship with the Creator is the tree of life. And we were cut off from that tree and there was death and sickness and the curse and a lot of stuff. and. Um, I don't have to tell you all about Western civilization's history. You can study it if you like. Uh, but there's, there's a sort of a, a thought, a spirit, a thought spirit, if you will, that's going around right now in Canada, where I grew up, United States, Europe. A lot of first world countries have this idea that uh, they look around and they see, oh, our our society is not perfect. We have screwed up there's a there's greed there's poor stewardship of the earth there's a, a lack of holistic understanding because of the scientific uh revolution that happened which was like maybe another case of too much tree of the knowledge of good and evil um without that uh you know there's nothing wrong with you know math or the brain logic logos but um, when it becomes the master instead of the servant, your mind is not meant to be a master. The spirit is meant to be a master. And then the soul, which is your mind, your will and emotions, is under and influenced by the spirit. Your mind can make plans and figure stuff out.
but uh, you know you still may read a recipe or whatever do some experiments but when you start uh, when the, when the because of the curse the mind became dominant and this has led to our uh, explosion in technology and there's a lot of things in in the western world that and there's a lot of things in the whole world that are pretty cool like I'm talking to you from a little device that's this big and I can record it and send this put it on the internet from the middle of the forest here in Romania um, but I wanted to address uh, one of my dear friends put a comment or a question on Facebook and she wrote that you know not only uh, is there apologies happening right now about how the colonial you know, expansion of England and France and the, the colonial uh, powers, European powers s that spread into North America and around the world. There's definitely, like she said, a, a good place for apology. Saying, whoa, we mistreated uh, the First Nations, indigenous, aboriginal people that were here. Um, some of the treaties, some of the places didn't even have treaties have been taken over. Some of the treaties that were signed were, it's disputable, it's arguable whether they were uh, fully explained and fair. Um, I don't want to get into that too much, but what she said also is she said we need to not only just apologize, but we need to look into these people's way of life and understand and learn from them. And the way that she spoke about them was that, you know, they had this harmonious, and this is, I guess, what I'm getting at, not just what she said, but a lot of people, there's this, I would say, uh, inaccurate and dangerous thought form that is like a bug in the system a thought virus that's really dangerous where a lot of people start thinking oh they were just this perfect harmonious people that were totally in harmony with nature and they were living this like Eden lifestyle this perfect Eden lifestyle and uh, that's not the case and I don't want to get into too much details because you know what if I look at my own roots, which are English, Irish, Norwegian, the kind of Vikings and stuff, the Vikings and the ancient Scandinavians were sacrificing people. They had slaves. They were fighting like cats and dogs, warring. They had um, raping and pillaging. Uh, Druids in, in Ireland were... We think, oh, Druids, Pagans, you know, that's cool. Well, they were sacrificing humans too to God so that they would have a good harvest, you know. <clears throat> these were people that were in, in darkness in terms of superstition. Uh, and depending on the culture, you know, there's different distinctions. Even when you talk First Nations, there's, there's a lot of difference between one tribe and another in different areas. So it's challenging to paint with a huge brush. But general concepts over the whole earth, cannibalism, slavery, war, human sacrifice, all over the earth. From Polynesia, Indonesia, you know, these places where there's headhunters, you know, and cannibalism. Uh, there's a story about a tourist. I'll, I'll wait and tell you the story. It's an interesting story. But all the way around the world you have this you have people that were li we in christian society call or christian understanding call it the fall they were living in, in the fall in total like pretty much total darkness some of them had a little bit of light they had an idea about a creator they had there's certain people you could look at uh some cultures and say oh they had they were having some light about treating each other well uh, walking with respect honoring the creator um in in the east you have like gotama buddha who came up with really ethical pretty uh uh 
for his time, because he was 500 years before Christ, pretty, uh, pretty cool way of living, which was just living poor. He basically was like, I'm going to live poor, I'm not going to live rich, even though he was a prince. He had lots of money, he could have lived wealthy. Um, and ethical and basics, do not steal, do not kill, no sexual immorality. That means no sex till marriage, because marriage is a vow and it's a covenant and it's for life. That's in Buddhism as well. People don't like Christianity because of that. It's in Buddhism too. Uh, it's in First Nations also, mostly. Like I said, each tribe is different, but marriage is respected all over the world in many ways too. Um, these, there was some, some sense of good, but like I said, humans had eaten from the tree of good and evil. So there was people that were trying to be good, but they were trying to be good in their own strength. And it was mixed in with war and pride and selfishness and fear and superstition like crazy like we think you know you throw if you spill salt you throw salt over your shoulder or someone sneezes and you say god bless you or you don't walk under a ladder this is like just a li the the little scratching the surface of superstition like people were in bondage to superstition and i've been i was into astrology for a while and you know i do believe that there's a connection between the planets and the earth and that these systems there's a there's a connection that it the creator actually made order and there's a story there in hebrew it's called the maseroth and that's where the truth is i believe because the hebrew the ancient hebrews understood the pictures to tell a story and it starts out with the virgin virgo and it ends with the lion the king lion of judah and christ it's the story of the messiah the redemption of the earth that's another, that'll be another broadcast. But uh, you can look into it. Anyway, um, what I'm getting at is that it's really dangerous for us to say, oh, these people, and it's really dangerous for us to tell First Nations people, oh, yeah, encourage them. Yeah, you need to just go back to your roots, and we Europeans screwed everything up for you. Um, because actually you're turning them back towards what was just at best a temporary holding system. Like even the best cultures anywhere on the earth, which you, you can hardly say the best, they're, they're still had horrible practices, a lot of them. And um, if you don't think that was happening in North America, you can go down to Mexico and you can look at the Aztec culture. You can go to a pyramid where they sacrificed 7,000 people in one day and tore out their hearts. So if you're a young woman, you might have been one of those virgins sacrificed to keep the sun burning. The worship of creation basically was the downfall in many ways of pretty much every culture. And what I say when I say worship of creation, I mean that the creator, and I've talked with First Nations people who get this, about the creator being invisible and above all and that you worship the creator you don't worship the sun the moon a person trees a forest because these things are temporary it's very dangerous to put your worship your worth on temporary things they can't help you a rock can't help you um, only the creator can fill that void in us and that relational need um, this is was not just in Mexico this was down in South America with the, the Incas. This was in North America too. And it's something that's been kind of covered up. If you look into histories, you'll find it. Uh, where I'm from, in the Bow Valley, near like between Banff National Park, Canmore, Calgary, this area, before Europeans got there, there was, there's generally evidence that it was Kootenai or Cree way back, like maybe you know many hundreds of years ago then when the blackfoot uh, got horses from through the south because horses this this is i got a lot of thoughts here so bear with me be patient please um when the blackfoot got horses they came up and pushed out the cree blackfoot and cree were fighting like cats and dogs and took over this land so then they said oh it's our land no it's a nice valley, you know. Then the Sioux people, which were over in like South Dakota, North Dakota, and hello, gypsy, 
This is Jupsters. Yeah. And I love the animals. Well, this would be good. I'm just going to pause that and talk about the dog days. Because we just saw a dog. This is Gypsy. So sweet. I went up, hiked up on the mountain, spent a few days on the mountain, uh, staying in my tent and hiking. And uh, there's a little ski village up there with a bunch of dogs and sheep. There's shepherds and sheep dogs. And this guy followed me down. This guy just followed me down. I didn't take him. He followed me. And he's so sweet. And so I'm planning today to go back up and see if I can... Oh, he doesn't want to go, but to go back up and uh, return him to... I think he has an owner. He has a name that someone told me his name's Gypsy, which is the perfect, uh, perfect accompaniment for me here. So the dog days. Before the Europeans came and the horses came with them, which was through Mexico, like the, the conquistadors, the Spanish, brought horses to Mexico, and then the horses through the native tribes came up through, you know, New Mexico and uh, up through there, um, basically moving up to Canada. Um, they, the people would set up their tent or their teepee, and they would use dogs. Uh, <laughs> I... <clears throat> Don't worry, I've been feeding them too. <clears throat> and some other people were too. <clears throat> so they moved everything with dogs. They had poles, so their teepee poles could only be so long. And then they uh, would put like two poles on either side of the dog and, and drag their stuff around. The dogs would do the dragon. And this still was going on in, with uh, the Inuit using dogs but uh it's interesting you know a lot of people are ignorant they look they think of first nations like the the blackfoot or the cree and they they think of them as these i did as well when i was growing up i had this image of like the native warrior and i wanted to be one i was like oh i wish that the that i was a native warrior and the europeans never showed up my thought when i was young i thought i would like to just go back in time and tell the First Nations along the Atlantic to just kill all the Europeans that showed up in boats. And then they would just have this perfect romantic life of being these natives. And I thought it'd be cool to have a, to have a, you know, a teepee and my, my native beautiful wife and hunt buffalo and ride horses. It'd be a horseback, you know, shooting your bow and arrow from horseback. I, I didn't realize they didn't have horses. <clears throat> and that as I researched it more that their life was not easy it was not perfect they were uh, had a lot of superstition a lot of um, practices which were um, uh, basically sorcery there's there's witch doctors or shamans that were uh there was different degrees, and there were some that were cannibals, some that were, this was more on the west coast of British Columbia, and you can look it up. There was some that were eaters of people, some that were eaters of dogs, and some that were just, it depended on this one distinction, um, which was in, uh, I forget the, the tribe, and I don't even need to, to say it, because I'm not talking about any one tribe, I'm just saying in general that these practices were there and uh, I saw one of the earliest explorers uh, who brought a camera in the 1800s took a picture of a, a squaw, a native woman with a big hole here because she had committed adultery and so they'd cut off her nose and that was the punishment if you committed adultery as a woman you got your nose cut off uh, so we have to be careful to just think, oh, I, you know, I wish I was living in that culture. Because, you know what, you may have your nose cut off if you committed sexual sin. If you, if you, uh, or you may be sacrificed if you were a virgin. <laughs> um, as far as I know, the, the, the Blackfoot and the Cree didn't sacrifice people in that sense. But they were fighting a lot. And they had like, again... I think a little bit of a healthier culture because it was smaller uh, tribes, 
didn't get into a big city system. <clears throat> but even then, uh, people say, oh, well, they were living harmoniously with the environment. The reason there was no horses in North America was that the early indigenous Aboriginal people wiped them out as food. People were eating horses as food. They wiped out the woolly mammoth. Generally, scientists think that the woolly mammoth and the uh, ancient horse was killed by ancient humans who were eating them for food. And they didn't figure out to ride them and or they didn't want to or whatever, but there was species that were hunted to extinction in North America before Europeans got there. Horses were reintroduced. <clears throat> They've found fossils of horses from before European times. So that and they, they generally think it was because of human hunting. So the the First Nations in North America were not just perfectly uh, harmonious. They had buffalo jumps, so they would run herds of buffalo off of a cliff. That's not an exact science. When you run a herd of buffalo off a cliff, you don't know how many buffalo are going to land down there and how many die, and you're not going to use every... I mean, they did use every part of the animal, but not every part of every animal. Sometimes they probably way overkilled, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just saying, this is part of the fallen creation. I'm not trying to point out, because you could look at any culture, anybody in the whole world can look at their history and go, whoa, this is so dark and so nasty. And this is the truth. And the, the reason I want to share the actual truth with you is because the hope that we have in the Creator is in a new heavens, a new earth, a redeemed earth, a re redemption, forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation because there was a disconnect. And so we need that reconnection. And if people are trying to live without that reconnection, which was sent by the Creator through one group of people, the Hebrews, which was, that's his choice. The Creator decided through Abraham, I'm going to send my seed, my perfect incarnation of love, and it's going to be a blessing to all nations. That's what it says in the Bible, that the, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, basically Emmanuel, God with us, is going to be the blessing for all nations and the way for all nations to come back to be reconciled to God. And it's the way is actually... For some people, it's like they scoff at it because it seems too easy. Just believe. Believe in Christ. Trust in Him. Trust that He paid all the karma, all the sin, and that we are reconciled with God. And if you believe and you trust in Christ Jesus, then you're reconciled with God. You're a child of God, and you're in the new creation. And it's already manifesting on earth, this new creation. But it will be fully, the kingdom of God will fully reign on earth again. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more death. There'll be no more tears, no more suffering. <clears throat> and this is our hope. And to try to go backward and try to go back to flawed systems, worshiping creation, for example. And worshiping creation doesn't mean just a tree or a rock or a mountain. Modern people worship creation. I worked at a car dealership where I saw people come in and worship luxury cars. You know, there was grown men that were drooling and living for their car. This is a worshipping a work of men's hands. Not very different than worshipping an idol, like a totem pole or a statue or whatever. Not all totem poles were worshipped. A lot of them were for telling stories. They were carved and you could tell a story by the, the pole. But um, I'm saying that a lot of cultures worshipped idols, rocks and things made with human hands, statues. It was... It, it was a sign of our depravity. It was a sign of how far humans fell from being divine children of God to worshiping rocks and stones and wood and things that can't help you at all and creation. And this was, God allowed this because humans chose this. He said, okay, if you go down that path, that's the consequences. And it needed to be shown because the way into heaven is hum a humble heart. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to be humble. It's hard for me. It's, it's, there's pride all over the earth and selfishness. And to actually just say, oh, okay, I'm not perfect and I need help. And I will 
I'm not the one that calls the shots. I'm not the one that gets to say what the plan of salvation is. The Creator can decide. He could have said, everyone wear green socks. If you wear green socks, you're in. And there would be people today that would probably be wearing orange socks because they'd be like, I'm not wearing green socks. I'm not going to do that here. You know? No matter how easy it is, I mean, it doesn't... He could have said to everyone that climbs Mount Everest <clears throat> is in. And then people would say, oh, you're making it so hard. Like, only people that are able to climb Mount Everest can be spiritual and get into heaven. So he made it very easy. Just... Have a bath, basically. Get baptized, which means you die to the old self, you go under the water, and you rise to the new self. And there's still people that, because, uh, and I was a rebel as well. I spent years as a prodigal son. And that's one of the reasons why I know a lot about different cultures. I went to China and studied Buddhism. I have a lot of experience with First Nations. Maybe not a lot, it's relative, but <clears throat> I'll just tell you. I have sat in circle in medicine wheel with uh, Mohawks and Iroquois of uh, Quebec and the Mohawks and Iroquois together is rare so I'm not exactly sure how um, oh look at this gold bug gold and black isn't that cool hallelujah um, I'm not exactly sure how uh, many there were of each because we were actually part of a martial arts group that there was First Nations and so we were invited to sit in Medicine Wheel and I've passed the pipe and uh, in the West I've I've sweated with um, people on the West Coast First Nations I, I was invited to the International Indigenous Leadership Gathering in Lillooet and uh, have spoken in circle there I've talked with a lot of elders. There's a lot of elders who get this. There's actually a lot of elders who, <clears throat> they know about Jesus. They know that God sent his son and they had some prophecies about this. There was a grandma that told me that her grandpa, or maybe great grandpa, was in uh, the Nisku, Niska River Valley. And the before the Europeans got there, the smallpox got there, <clears throat> which was, there's argue about how much was intentional and how much was not. There is some rare cases or maybe more where it was intentionally spread by some whiskey traders and some evil people. They knew that there was smallpox on the blankets and they would trade these blankets, which was horrible. There is also a lot of the spread of smallpox, which was unplanned. You know, this was like people were sick. They went over to the new world and then they didn't know, but First Nations had no immunity millions of people were wiped out because of smallpox but this uh, at, uh, this international indigenous leadership gathering uh, First Nations woman told me that her grandpa <clears throat> or great grandpa had g gotten smallpox and got sick and he knew he had a revelation or in intuition that he was going to die and that this was carried through the air, through the wind. And he said, you cannot bury me or anyone that dies of this sickness up in the trees because they did a sky burial. They would wrap the bodies and put them up in trees in British Columbia in that area. And he said, you have to dig a hole and bury me and uh, don't come over near for a long time. And so he got his sons to put him in the back of the canoe. They paddled him up river. They said, he said, dig a hole. He said, I'm going to sit by the hole and when I, I'm ready to die, I'm going to just roll into the hole and you come back later and bury me. So they cried and they left him there sitting by this hole and they waited a few days and they heard the wind through the trees in a certain way. They said, okay, we think he's gone. And they paddled back up river and he was standing right there, they, they sitting by the hole and... Uh, they thought, whoa, he's still alive. And they wondered if it was a ghost, his ghost. And he said, no, 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 come, come. I'm okay. I'm healthy. And they said, what? And he said, yeah. And they said, what happened? He said, I was so sick. I was about to die. I was about to roll into that hole. And you see that mountain there, that ridge. He said, uh, over that ridge, a light like a star came. And it was bright. And it got brighter 
and there was a man in the star. And the man had holes in his hand, in his wrist. The holes were right here. And in his feet. And he said, you're going to be the chief of this people. And I'm going to heal you. And I want you to take care of this people. And he gave him some instructions. And this man was healed miraculously. And interesting, you know, years later, the Roman Catholic missionaries showed up and said, we're here to tell you about Jesus, the Savior. And he died. Uh, he was nailed to a cross for your sins and you believe in him. They said, oh, yeah, I think this, this, this man had become the chief. He said, yeah, I think I've met this man. Said, what? He said, he said, yeah, he has holes right here. And he pointed to his, to his wrists, to his wrists right here. And the Roman Catholics said, no, no, he's, it's in the hand. The, the hole is in the hand. And he said, no, I'm pretty sure the holes were right there. And they said, no, it was in the hand. He said, no, I'm pretty sure they were right there. And uh, it's interesting because independent of this story, I've found out that, you know, people that are doctors that study the crucifixion as far as what the effects of, would be on the body. And definitely it was a torturous, horrible way to die. And they made sure you were dead and it killed you by suffocation. And then they also would, they speared Jesus in the side through the heart. But... Um, they would hang the person generally if the whole if the nail was in the hand it would tear out so it had to be between these two bones in the wrist which was in the greek the word for hand is that whole like lower arm so this is evidence that this first nations chief had a closer relationship a closer knowledge to jesus than uh the roman catholic priest that showed up at least in this regard um and you know what there's there's probably many cases where the, the, and Jesus said, there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. And there's going to be people representing me that are not following me, not representing me. So I'm not trying to promote any uh, church, any specific church. I'm not trying to um, get you to go somewhere Sunday morning. This is way bigger than that. This is about who you're trusting your life to and that you can trust the New Testament scriptures, which were written not by you know, powerful church, uh, robe-wearing, um, you know, political, military leaders. The New Testament was written by disciples that had been scattered in fear after the crucifixion of Christ. And only the resurrection of Christ could have galvanized them and energized them enough to go from being scattered in fear to being so bold that almost all of them were martyred, were killed for their faith. And they were told to stop telling this story about Jesus and how he's king and how he raised, rose from the dead. And they said, no, we've seen him. Sorry, we can't lie. And he is going to be the king of the whole world. And we're spreading his kingdom of love and forgiveness. And we only worship the creator of the universe and not rocks and trees. Anyway, the, the Jews and the Romans persecuted the early Christians so heavily Yet, the New Testament was written by eyewitnesses. This is a faithful account. So you can read the New Testament. <clears throat> and it's meant for all peoples. And I'm just reading now in a church historian, Eusebius, which was written in the year 300, about what happened in Jerusalem 40 years after. God gave Jerusalem 40 years of grace to repent. And a bunch of them did. And those ones were warned by prophets within the church there to leave and actually by Jesus own prophecies as well that when certain signs happened which they noticed to leave to run away from Jerusalem and head for the hills and the the ones that didn't the Jews that were stubborn and didn't believe in Christ they stayed and tried to fight the Romans in Jerusalem and it was probably the ugliest worst siege I mean we're talking like hundreds of thousands, if not um, more than two million people that were killed or like brutally starved to death were eating each other in Jerusalem because there was a two-year siege. I mean, no food. People were eating their kids. It was really bad. 
And this is what humans' depravity gets to when it rejects God. Uh, it's God's grace that we have abundance and blessing, and uh, it's a, He's being very patient, 2,000 years, to make sure that the gospel of forgiveness spreads around the whole earth. And like I said, there's prophecies that told that there would be people that would pollute the church, you know, good seeds and bad seeds planted together. So you have to go yourself and have a personal relationship with God and personally read the Bible and listen to the Holy Spirit and be led and understand that your relationship, it can be helped through teachers and pastors. It can be blessed and ministered through by people that are uh, like mentors, people in the church, community. But ultimately, uh, we are saved one by one. And it's, we're saved out of a tribal system into a better tribal system, into a better family, into one. I've, I've met native people, they say, all my relations. But the actual, the actual uh, historical evidence says that before Europeans showed up, they were not saying all my relations. They were, they had arch enemies. They loved fighting with each other, as a lot of humans do. Generally the men, although women fight with each other in different ways. And I, one of the elders that I've talked to, First Nations elder, said he believes that the Europeans coming was an actual judgment from the Creator because the First Nations had been mistreating their women, had been living evil and had turned bad uh, about you know, a few hundred years before uh, the Europeans came. I'm not going to comment on that too much other than to say that this was a First Nations indigenous man saying we needed a correction. We were way out of line. Um, I don't believe that we should ever try to be a judgment or a correction for people in that way. I think that the sad thing is that the church got mixed in with government so that all of a sudden the people that were in government which Jesus didn't do. He didn't get mixed in with government and powers and armies <clears throat> and e economy and trying to be a capitalist Christian in the way like where, you know, the, they were kind of linked together. And, you know, it's, there is a place for economy and, and business. And, but when the missionaries are traveling with the conquistadors who are just trying to get gold and the missionaries are trying to get souls, there's going to be varied results and some of the missionaries were more you could say uh, just serving the conquistadors and the gold others of the missionaries when you read some of those stories I mean they were oh, I'll return to that story I was going to tell you there's a story of a European tourist who went to I think Fiji and he got off the boat and he was checking out the area and he saw this little white church and he and there was a, a, a tribal gathering. Fiji is still has tribal indigenous people and a chief and everything. Um, and he said to this uh, leader, he said, oh, those Christians, uh, they showed up here. I can see that church and, you know, they ruined everything, the co colonialists. And, and uh, the chief said, Oh, wait, hold on a minute. He said, uh, you see that big white stone over there? That big light colored boulder? And the tourist said, yeah. And he said, beside that, do you see the big dip in the boulder? Yeah. He said, well, if those missionaries hadn't showed up, this is where we'd be cutting you up right now and we'd be cooking you in there. So that was a little bit of a heads up for this European tourist that was all, you know, atheist and like trying to romanticize these perfect, harmonious, indigenous people, First Nations people in Fiji. It was like, yeah, without the missionaries, we'd be eating you right now. This is what an indigenous leader said, the chief. So we have to be careful to not romanticize. That's kind of my main point. And when you, when you feed into this and you tell people oh yeah you had this perfect culture that we screwed up and you basically are turning them backwards to a dead end because 
there is, and I'm not saying, I'm not attacking the things that are beneficial and good. I mean, uh, in terms of knowing about uh, natural things, like the First Nations have a knowledge of herbs and herbal remedies and uh, sensitivity to wildlife and nature that's wonderful. But if they were producing plastic, there would probably be remnants of plastic bottles in the river from them before the Europeans because they were part of fallen humanity just like everybody else. And uh, I could tell you more stories. I could tell you I've researched even in in Alberta and, and in Canada. The uh, I don't want to get into it too much because like I said, I don't want to be pointing out any one tribe or practice because all over the world, huma humans without Christ like, were broken. The original humans were cursed to experience sickness and death. They were still blessed. God still gave them grace and blessings of sun and rain and uh, provision and lots of... And the Bible actually makes provision, you could say, for people that had not heard about Christ. Like if you were in the Amazon jungle a thousand years ago, there was no missionaries, there was no gospel of Jesus that uh, was from the New Testament anyway. But the Bible says that everyone will be judged according to the light that was in them. So if someone had a little bit of light, let's say they had a, their conscience was, they, let's say they killed a deer in the jungle, they killed a deer, and their neighbor, they knew their neighbor was hungry. If that person shared the deer with their neighbor, that's Christ right there. I mean, that's the love of Christ. So that person already, when they will meet Jesus, they will already be open to accept Christ because they were already practicing the light that they had. And there's many First Nations and many people that are, uh, it's called the Red Path. You know, people that are walking, endeavoring to walk with uh, respect and love and generosity and peace. And uh, if someone is diligently seeking truth, then they will come to more truth. And the challenge for some people is they say, well, I'm seeking truth, but they're not fully seeking truth. So when they come to more truth, which is Christ Jesus, they're like, oh, it can't be that. It's got to be anything but him. And I was like that too. And a lot of it was because Satan used the mistakes of the church and the, you know, the history of the church in Europe is gross and in, in the North America as well. A lot of mistakes. Satan used those mistakes to have people focus on and be like, oh, I don't want to be part of that. Like, of all the religions, think about it, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, is so messed up. And part, part of it is because, if you think about it, if you were an enemy and you wanted to attack and cover up some truth, you would go for the heart, you'd go for the core, you'd go and attack th that church. You try to infiltrate and have there be... And a friend said this to me recently, and it's a good point. He said, not all priests are child molesters. Like, this is like a fraction. A lot of people are... A lot of these priests are wonderful. They have orphanages. They're helping people. But society and media focuses on if there's a small percentage of priests that are doing this. And in the Roman Catholic Church, I know it was worse. I'm not trying to stand up for them because I think it at least at times it became the antichrist and jesus prophesied that um or was a one version of it um and not just them orthodox church has gotten really traditional and ritualistic and rule-based and it's there's not a lot of uh freedom and love that i've experienced uh, in orthodox churches like monasteries i've visited some and they're like and i'm like whoa Yes, he died on a cross, but also, hello, he rose again. It's not a funeral. It's not so serious. And He rose again. We're supposed to be happy and thankful and graciously loving. And it's not just about, you know, humans are so susceptible to religion and um, religious pride and, and trying to do things in their own effort that this can actually, religion can be the tree of knowledge of good and evil as well. 
just like rebellion. And Jesus was about not religion and not rebellion, but the narrow path of relationship with the Creator through Him, trusting that the Creator sent a perfect incarnation to be the last human sacrifice. No more human sacrifices, anybody. Go back to whatever ways. No human sacrifices. So I'm all about redeeming the good, the, the you could say, redeeming the healthy things. Like, for example, I love a, a sauna or a sweat lodge. I love praying in the dark, in the heat. I've been in sweat lodges before. And there's sweat lodges where the Creator is honored and focused on. And I'm all about that. Like, it's great. And there's a lot of Christian First Nations. I was working on a reserve in Canada that was... Like, I've, I was there for the better part of every week for a year. Um, and uh, even then, as a woman, you have to realize if you were, if you're trying to go back to this system, there's some tribes, differs between Cree and Blackfoot, where you're not allowed, if I was a woman, you're not allowed to sweat. Uh, it's only men sweating. This is something that you're trying to go back to, you know. Now, if you sit in circle, you better wear a dress. <laughs> That's, you better dress appropriately. So there's, there's things that some people are, are uh, you know, they're saying, oh, I want to dress however I want. I should be able to dress however I want. And I love First Nations, you know, traditional history. It's like, well, that's a contradiction because if you were really into First Nations, they would, those elders, those women would say, cover yourself modestly, you know. Yet, if a Christian tells you to cover yourself modestly, they're a bigot and a jerk and whatever. So what I'm trying to point out is there's a little bit of like the enemy puts animosity in us against Christ and Christianity through different ways, through the, the, the mistakes of the church, through just darkness and, and uh, lies, fantasies of thinking, oh, if we just go back to earth-based religion and, and paganism or First Nations, they were living harmoniously. No, they were worshipping created idols, rocks and logs and sticks and idols, and they were sacrificing to them. This is the depravity that humans go to when they're disconnected from an active, live relationship with Creator and worshipping Him only. And as you learn more truth, you realize that's through His Son. That's how He chose to do it. And it's actually a gracious thing because it's easy. Anyone can come. It's not a hard thing. You don't have to climb Mount Everest. It's, um, you know, anyone with physical disabilities is welcome. <laughs> you know, they can get into water and be baptized or someone can help them. They can, and that's it. And you, you love one another. That's the one commandment that Jesus gave, the most important. He said, this is a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Which, when you actually try to follow it, when you try to follow his teachings, you realize, whoa, this is really high. This is the highest level. Because if you look at how Jesus loved, it was completely selfless. He didn't have, like, personal possessions. I mean, he was the Lord of everything, but he was living homeless and poor. I mean, I have more. With my tent and my backpack, I have more stuff. And I've endeavored to give up lots of stuff and live simply and trust him and try to go around doing good stuff and but r really we can't do it on our own that's what I've come to we need the strength from the Holy Spirit we need that new birth and God in us that relationship for us to even be selfless for us to love one another there's times where I'm like Lord am, I'm I don't have the power right now to forgive this person or to share or to be nice like help me and he helps you know, and if I make a mistake, I realize, okay, I was, you know, I was lusting or I was being selfish or uh, angry or whatever. That was walking in the old nature, walking in the fallen self. I'm sorry, I was walking in the flesh and not the spirit. And uh, it's like you forget your new identity and sometimes you walk in the old identity. But this identity thing is huge. And this is what people are looking for. And this is why they go and, oh, maybe if I go into the First Nations, that will give me identity. You know, maybe maybe your roots genetically are First Nations, or maybe you just think, oh, if I 
if I can find some sense of belonging in this group or that group, and people are looking for their, to make their identity based on a group or a practice or a gender, you know, oh, this is my sexuality or whatever, this is my body, I'm going to change my body and be this identity or whatever. So many, some people it's more shallow, some people it's like, we are from this town. Even in Europe, so many people in different towns, they're so proud of their town and they stay there for generations. But this sort of tribalism, these sort of like shallower identities um, can get in the way of the true identity that you are meant for, which is as a son and or a daughter of God, a child of God, and a, the beloved, accepted in the beloved. Jesus used the analogy of marriage and said, if you believe you're the bride of Christ, he loves you like his wife. And this marriage will be consummated soon in, in terms of the kingdom of God will come to earth. And uh, those who don't believe will be condemned because they're, they're not accepting God's grace or forgiveness. And it's humbling. They say, no, I'm going to make my own way and find my own way to peace. But actually, that's rebellion. Trying to be religious on your own strength, trying to be a good person apart from God's way is actually like com competition with God. You're basically trying to be God. That's when you get down to the psychological roots of it. It's pride. And pride is like the most dangerous thing. More deadly than lust in many ways. Lust, yeah, people chase after flesh and each other, but uh, this, people can even... Even many people from around the world, different cultures, realize, okay, this is leading me nowhere and this is just gross and I'm mistreating people or whatever. Porn is, you know, there's psychological profiles, like experiments where they've examined the brain of people that look at porn and it actually changes your brain and messes your brain up. It rewires your sexuality so it has to be visual. It's poison. Don't be into porn. Don't be into lust. But pride is even worse. And some pride is very subtle and comes in the form of, well, I don't want to do that way. I'm going to do it myself. And so this is why, you know, I've experienced this where I've met First Nations people. I've been on reserves. I've been kicked off of reserves where I've just been taking pictures along a road, like a main public road where I pull over and take some pictures. And the people come, this is private land, you're trespassing. And I, you know, say, wait a minute. Don't you guys have a different, you know, like First Nations people, a lot of people say, oh, they have this idea that the land is everyone's. You can't own land. I believe that, true. The, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We don't own it. We may be tenants on it. I mean, he's given it to humans to manage. And in Christ, it will be paradise again. But uh, this idea that Europeans came and messed things up is not serving First Nations people because they have, then they get an animosity and they're like, oh, you, you're, you're a European, you're trespassing. He didn't, these guys, two of them, didn't, two different times, didn't ask me what I was doing, if I was lost, if I was, you know, well, I, they could see I was like taking pictures of this river. Uh, they didn't ask me if I had a friend on the reserve, if I had, you know, been working and helping people on that reserve, uh, I had, didn't know these particular people. You know, I've been to powwows out there. Um, I love the singing and drumming and dancing. Um, but the, this was part of that attitude, and it comes from this lie that, and the, an animosity. And you know what? I wasn't mad at them. I understand that they were at least in part mistreated. But if you tell them, oh yeah, you know, your culture and your society was perfect and we came and ruined everything, yeah, they're gonna have an animosity. If you tell them the truth, which is we're all broken, every culture was broken <clears throat> and we all need Christ and the, the Christians screwed up too and need to in many ways come back to Christ, sell everything, share it with the poor, <laughs> follow him um, these realizations are power because then they unite and they create actual all my relations 
there's there's more that I was uh, thinking about sharing, but right now I think that's it. You, if you made it this far in the video, you are patient. You're a seeker of truth. God has given you grace, and thanks for carving out some time. Um, and I hope that you pray about this. Maybe take a walk in beautiful creation and talk to the Creator and ask Him. Read read the New Testament and pray and say, Is this the way? This Yeshua, this Jesus, is this the one that you sent? Is, is this how you want me to relate with you? In His presence is fullness of joy and delights forevermore. Hallelujah! Yeah. I love you all. Truly, in Christ, all my relations are all one blood. Shalom, Yeshua.